Hello, and welcome to season four of The Dive. Now we have four hosts as well, as Jat will return. Whoa. No, 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 he's a special guest. <laughs> okay, yeah. special guest. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, to be clear, I will be a guest on The Dive occasionally, as you've been saying on Twitter, Yeah. and then also be doing the Josh Leeson experience occasionally throughout the week. Yep. You can have more than one podcast. It's like, no really longer a committed idea. relationship. You know, he just yeah. comes <laughs> and he goes, you know, he stays he, with us as long as he feels. He always wants to come back, part though. part of us wants something new. <laughs> I wanted to have, like, a but if you love podcast, someone, you let Joe. them go yeah. and come back from time to time. Yeah. Like that's really true love, right there. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. What if for, you just for stayed because yeah. you were happy? What about that? <laughs> Stay yeah, together for the kids. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, uh, the Josh Leesman experience is not satisfying you. And so you're like, guys, can I, can I come back onto the dive? <laughs> There's a lot of things, you know, as, as you age. I'm done with, I'm done, I'm done with this oh, no. This is like, <laughs> oh, no. I was like, oh, Kobe's going down Dangerous Road. I was like, oh, Jack, I, join them. Oh, interesting. Here Jack's we go. like, <laughs> slide down here. Let me know when we start talking about League of Legends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so. LPL. Uh, oh, actually, you had a report that you want to start us off. With. Yeah, um, I know we're gonna do this later, but yeah. But the I, segment, it's reports and honors. Reports and honors. So he wanted he wanted to sneak in one report before we got to that. We're okay. gonna do that after our global news, but he what wanted to sneak so in one. Pressing. I thought this was to gonna be a now. smooth way. Yeah, to I just thought, flip it in. And I thought no. you were gonna intro, and then I was gonna be like, I'm reporting it. I was gonna just jump in. Well, I didn't uh, know how to jump out of the the other conversation. Yeah, we gotta get out of there somehow. Yeah. So I'm reporting the the coronavirus, <laughs> just because the best thing about the start of the league season is like four leagues usually start up, and you get to have all these games, and for us as analysts, is all this stuff to watch and see worldwide trends and all this stuff, and to, all of it gets put on hold, uh, which is really really unfortunate. Obviously, there's bigger concerns that go along with this. This yeah. is a very narrow lens that I'm, I'm looking at it from. <laughs> so I, yeah. I understand that like there's much bigger concerns, but uh, I am selfishly reporting it for hurting my ability to analyze the league <laughs> worldwide. Well, yeah, when you were explaining this in the morning, I was like, all right, here we go. I get, I'll let you do what you want to do, Mark. But uh, if we're it. going down this route, then I'm reporting uh, hunger and poverty <laughs> and <laughs> racism, all forms of bigotry. Um, those are good ones. Those are good reports. Uh, those, you know what? That's actually like a good like thing. Every every you should good report. If you see yeah. that, you should report it. You should. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we want this to be the trend for our reports and honors uh, section. I mean, this one does tie in specifically to uh, one of the top four leagues getting postponed indefinitely until this crisis resolves. So I think it ties in a little bit. Yeah, and, and that's what we were going to talk about, right? The yeah. LPL is on hold. And, you know, this means that, that, that they are actually going to be falling pretty far behind schedule wise, mm. right? And and could theoretically have some impact on their play going into MSI because they are a league that is already broadcasting seven days a week. So yeah. every day that they are, you know, off and, and kind of getting delayed by this, that's more and more games that are piling up they have to catch up on. Yeah, and to be completely clear, like, none of us have any say in LPL league formatting or schedules, so this would all be, like, pure speculation. I'm wondering, like, it was going to take a break anyway for Chinese New Year. Mm-hmm. So it was supposed to come back February 5th. The fact that they suspended it indefinitely, like, over a week ago makes me think they're already thinking fairly far into the future. So it's like... How far into the year would they need to be off before they make drastic changes to the format? How does that do with MSI? Like we have the new schedule in NA where teams are playing three days a week, right? LPL was already playing seven with home and homes and all these other types of like travel things in. Mm -hmm. If they either compress the schedule or only like, I don't don't know what could possibly happen, but it is, it, it could end up being very impactful for the LPL. Yeah, I mean, the English casters for the English broadcast of LPL actually left the country yeah. as well because yeah. the, they don't know when it's going to come back. And LPL is right now the strongest region, you know, mm-hmm. back-to-back winners. Mm-hmm. Um, they play the most. They have the most teams. So this is it's going to be interesting to see how this does end up affecting the global scale. Yeah, I mean, hopefully they're going to be able to to get everything you know fixed. Reports yeah. and honors. Do so you want to follow up after we had the early start from Mark? <laughs> sure. All right. So uh, I can start. So I am going to report TSM for tanking my stocks. Okay. I all in on them. Okay. I bought nine TSM. And I'm unhappy about it. I mean, that's you. That's your hey, you were, like a you personal debating, problem, bro. <laughs> you were debating buying TSM too. I bought all in Cloud Nine. That's Duo. a good start. Uh, a good start. I'm feeling pretty good. <laughs> so I'm reporting TSM and I'm going to honor my boy Lee Sin because Lee Sin is 5-1 and one in the LCS. It is looking like the what best jungler by Darnock far. What about when played him? 
It's 0-1 when TSM plays him, <laughs> which again, back to reporting TSM for tanking my stocks. But uh, and Lee tanking Sin's, Lee Sin's win rate. Yeah, and tanking <laughs> yeah. Lee Sin's win rate. I would have been Did you see the otherwise. speaker kicking out Mike I did. Academy play? That, that was, was incredible. That, that was, was so good. And that was actually, uh, I, I was going to tag that on because it's on uh, Lolly Sports Instagram now. Maybe on Twitter as well. But okay. they posted a highlight of it. So you guys should check yeah. that out. He kicked Mike Young out of the pit. Ended that man's career. <laughs> <laughs> Again? Uh, what, that's one of those he's already dead uh, memes to say, oh, what's going on here? Stole the elder, but it was hype. Yeah. All right. Um, my report, <laughs> we don't tell each other these beforehand, but yeah. TSM is included in my report as well. <laughs> oh, I'm reporting both TSM and Immortals for putting me through that 60-plus minute game <laughs> <laughs> where... Nobody could end it. Fighting over, we had two Elder Dragons. Uh, I don't know how many Barons. And Is no, that the longest game of the year so far? Uh, for, for sure. For sure, it's the remember. longest game of the year. Uh, Welcome to North America, everybody. Enjoy your stay. <laughs> but I was going to honor FlyQuest for not only hmm. Uh, hmm. deciding to be the um, environmentally conscious team, but winning. So it's one thing to be like, all right, we're going to take this new angle and you know, plant trees and for kills, but then you actually have to get the kills. And they're 2-0, starting out looking so much better. We had them, all of us, near the bottom of the power rankings. They weren't last, but they were on the bottom uh, threshold there. Mm -hmm. And they've come out. They've they've done what we were speculating and kind of mm -hmm. asking for them. Centaurin looked better. They got uh, Riven for Viper. <laughs> So they got on his birthday. Now, now they, birthday. Yeah, now they've got their their guaranteed ban again. All the teams are like, ah, yes, uh, Riven will be the ban in the first phase. So uh, I think FlyQuest is really coming out of the gates looking strong. So I actually had the same honor, but it was more about the PR side, and specifically, I was going to honor Trisha, their new CEO, um, mm -hmm. because when I heard the environmental pitch, like the go green, and like I thought, you know, it was just going to be like our carbon footprint's low or something that's not as fun. Or like their color is green. Fake yeah, we're so or, green. Well, like still <laughs> real. Like we installed solar panels, but that's not fun as a viewer, right? And so the fact that they tied it into getting kills and ocean drakes and all this other mm. stuff for dubs. Yeah, it's it just <laughs> shrubs for dubs is good. Uh, like just how they I incorporate it. Twitter, I, uh, I know anything yeah. that's really good that what do you guys say? I'm like they saw that. Yeah, there. hundred trees or whatever <laughs> if they ever beat them. Yeah, but like I just think it was a, a very smart way of incorporating that brand identity because on another show I do. People have called in and been like, "I'm a huge FlyQuest fan, but I'm embarrassed by their by like their brand and stuff. Like they had gotten slammed by their own. Like it was it was bad. So the fact that they now have something that people are memeing mm -hmm. positively on Reddit and Twitter and all this other stuff is is actually huge for them. It is really cool. And and, and Trisha actually has a huge esports background. Mm -hmm. She was in the SC2 scene. You know mm -hmm. when I was in the SC2 scene, like ten years ago now. You know she was uh, I think actually competing as as a pro or semi pro for a while, and she's been involved in esports for. She was at. Because I remember her from like 10 years ago, yeah. even when I did WCG yeah. uh, and meeting her and stuff. And I was like, you're the CEO of FlyQuest now? That's so cool. Like, I haven't seen you in years. Uh, it's always nice to see, you know, the old school people come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I like if both of you guys had the same report. Because even even the official LCS Twitter account was roasting that game. They posted the <laughs> like, when TSM Immortals hit 60 minutes and it's like them getting poke with a stick, do something. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That one was so funny. Yeah. Are we gonna Are we going to talk about TSM later or should I also just report them? Oh, my we God. We can talk about them no. You, yeah, well, you, you gotta have a different one. You okay. didn't even I, have your. You told in. me, Zale told me that this doesn't have to be league related. No, yes. it can be whatever. So you I want. have True. just a really stupid report. Okay. Okay. I'm reporting the letter Q for being too early in the alphabet. <laughs> tie it in. Okay. It, right. We're with you. There doesn't need to be a tie in. It's just think of the positioning. The fact that R, S, and T are actually after Q. Doesn't Q feel like it should be? It does actually. Like in the yeah, last five letters that. around, like the W's and the Y's You're and the kind X's. You're my mind. I feel like it should yeah. be back there with the Y and the Z. The fact that there's nine the letters after Q blown. at least. No, think that about might the, be 10. I haven't actually counted. You're, it's just so early. You're horribly wrong. First off, look at a P and then look at a Q. It's the same, same thing flipped. That's why they're next to each other. Z, Y, X, W, V, U, T, Q. I don't care about oh. use cases because then E should be first. It's the most common letter in the English language. Well, it just it doesn't feel. I'm 100 percent with Mark here, by the way. <laughs> That's rare. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, it, it is I'm rare. Just Whoa, there, slow down. <laughs> yeah, Azale agreed with me. That's enough. <laughs> no, they're, they're <laughs> yeah. next to each other because P and Q. 
All right, so next. I like where your head's at. Okay. It should be next. Uh, to, if you want to be anything, it should be next to you because you almost every Q is followed by you. Q, Q, quarterly, The league tie-in is when I'm looking at some of our, like, internal data when I was on game design trying to, like, balance Kiana. I'd always scroll past. So I oh, was like, how the did that? Because like, there's like Trundle the and like Senna <laughs> and Syndra are all after. Uh, sometimes I, I look at the alphabet it. and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, Jet's a little bit rusty. Ramis, Ramis back, is you know? after Kiana. Are you see like, the JLXP where he can just ramble and no one is like, hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> how dare they? Who made <laughs> yeah. the alphabet? Let's get them. Exactly. This is a solo R is podcast after topic. Q? <laughs> uh, my honor is more related. I am going to honor Cloud9 for no team has consistently lost the offseason more while still being in first place. It's weird how that keeps happening, but consistently they find just good rosters to put together. I think Sven, I think Sven is in for a really big year. Uh, he seems motivated and he seems happy, and I think that team's good. I, I am really excited for Blabber as well. Mm -hmm. um, for him to have a starting position like that, um, and I think he's an incredibly intelligent jungler. I think people give him too much flame for sure. it, yeah, for sure. it being really easy. Everyone just always goes back to the story that was established for him, you know, when he was in academy, just at the very beginning. And they're like, all right, yeah. this is the crazy guy. He's always crazy. He's yeah, gonna go. Turns his brain off. Yeah. Um, his brain is on, so yeah. So his, I, his brain just yeah. works differently. I, and also, <laughs> Reaper, Reaper, Reaper kind of propagates that too, because there, there's the whole Cloud Nine yeah. brain check. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that the brain check is for everyone, though. It's not a blabber specific thing. <laughs> I so. have heard him say he, blabber always fails the brain check. <laughs> but he's been making that on like if you listen to their, their check ins on uh, the, the he's been making that joke for years. I remember yeah, he had, I think yeah. he even had that with contracts. Like, is your brain on today? Yeah. And impact and and rave. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's for all of them. Yeah. yeah. All right, so there have been a lot of things going on with the meta uh, okay. and, and with the patch. Most of them, most of the most outspoken people have been talking about jungle. Uh, and recently there was a post uh, from the Bounds team. Jungle experience is on the list uh, that, going up. that Mark posted for, for buffs. That's that cool. being said, let's talk about the state of the jungle in the LCS and then what is going to be the state of the jungle in the LCS for a couple more weeks because we don't update patches um, until a couple weeks after they have been released to live. Yeah, so if they end up buffing jungle in 10.3, that yep. means it'll be an LCS in week four because we're going to be on patch 10.2 mm -hmm. for exactly. the next two weeks. Um, and and this, is, this is one of the biggest things. And of course, I talk about it a lot because this is what I focus on mm -hmm. also for climbing solo queue. <clears throat> um, but... I think one thing with all everyone just complaining generically about the jungle, um, they don't actually look at the specifics. Mm -hmm. And I have a piece that's going to come out for LCS on broadcast Ooh. next week that is going to have literally all the numbers for the efficiencies of the different camps. But one of the things that people pass over the most is a lot of the nerfs were scaling nerfs to the jungle. It's not everything's created equal generic flat nerfs to jungle experience. Mm. The biggest differences are how you change your game plan as the game goes longer. Um, and the further that you get into the game, the more you're losing out because they nerfed a lot of the ramping of the jungle experience for the camps. They don't scale as mm -hmm. well. And so basically for your solo queue, what you need to take to heart from this, if you want to simplify it down, is the longer the game goes, play more with your team. It is not worth taking an extra wolf camp. It is not worth taking an extra raptor camp because those camps are depleted now, especially later in the game, and you should be making team plays. I mean, just look at the 60-minute game. Dardock was like level 16 after 60 minutes. He couldn't get 18. I think even the enemy support was 17. You know, like, mm -hmm. I don't... I, I, the scaling point's really big about how much it drops off, I think. Yeah. I'd also say, you know, kind of the other, the other end of that is that when you have an early advantage, you need to press, right? You know, and I think that mm -hmm. we have seen that that hasn't always been the case. You know, the, the games where a jungler is doing well and actually pushing their lead, it doesn't... When you're watching it, it doesn't really feel that different besides, yeah, their level is lower and you notice that every once in a while, but, like, they still feel like they're having a really big impact. Um, but... You know, if, if you do kind of take your, your foot off the gas pedal at all, if you're not constantly actually snowballing that lead, then it, it feels pretty meaningless later on, right? You know, in that Dardock Elise game, he got two very early kills. It was by four minutes, I think he was 2-0, but mm -hmm. then he wasn't really involved in anything for, for quite a long time after that. And it does feel like you have to be proactive, you have to be pushing your advantage and making the most out of it because the further into the game you get, you're going to be more and more out-leveled by the solo laners and your impact does get lessened. And 
to ramble a little bit more about the jungle <laughs> and rant on it. Nice. Um, <laughs> a ramble and a rant. I got one after well, you. Okay. So one of the answers or counter arguments or people responding to me when I was complaining about these jungle uh, changes on paper before they actually happened, um, people were saying, oh, but they're going to reduce the spawn timer. So theoretically, if you farm the jungle over and over on <laughs> cooldown, <laughs> then you'll get more experience. And the problem with people thinking about it that way is that the jungle is not an isolated system. There is always an opportunity cost to mm -hmm. every action you take. Yep. The reason, whole reason I became a jungler is because you're keeping track of all these different variables across the whole map. And you have to look at your choices as individual objectives, just a single camp. Is it worth doing this gromp or this raptor camp for the amount of time that it actually takes me to clear it. Um, if the reward for that camp went down, the time to do it did not go down. Mm -hmm. It is a less efficient objective. It is worth less of your time. So then why would I want to do that less efficient depleted objective more often? Well, you're, you're respawning it faster so I can do a sh that shittier camp more often? Well, and it, it the, the punish isn't there then. Like, if in, in old, when, you know, respawn timers were high but XP was high, or excuse me, respawn timers were low, if you went for a gank in the bot side and the other guy saw that and he went and invaded your top jungle and took, you know, your mm -hmm. gromp and your wolves because your, your bot gank failed, you actually felt that. Like, you're like, oh, crap. That gank was not worth it. I shouldn't have gone for yeah. that because it was a hard game. And your to camp off. was gone for a long time. So, yeah. like, while counter jungling without catch up experience and leaving stuff alive is like more important, if you actually counter jungle and clear the camp, it's incredibly inefficient. That That's very, yeah. that's a very big point because counter jungling and leaving a small piece alive did get better because they put more experience into the big chicken. Yeah. And the little ones are, where, are basically useless. So, always, if you're counter jungling, you always leave a small wolf, always leave whatever amount of small chickens you want behind because those are yeah. worth even and less. And try and leave the, the baby krug. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and take the big one because yeah, the, the, the big one. things are, are worth uh, yeah. way more. I I probably have a lot to say on the jungle. I know we've maybe yeah. repeated it a lot, but I wanted it's to It's a big topic. I wanted to kind of double up on one of the things you said about respawning camp timers. And this this is partially related to pro, but probably more related to why the jungle has felt so unsatisfying for so many junglers especially me, uh, because I have been an efficiency jungler who often likes Ooh, taking- dear. Yeah, but I, I often like taking the somewhat low percentage play that'll be a guaranteed reward versus like a high variance play. Um, so like just mentally, what ends up happening is if your camp is up, every, every second that camp is up, your mind has been telling you, ooh, it's inefficient not to clear that. That's Your like mind. My mind. <laughs> and I think a lot of people, um, okay. because- the adjustment to this jungle, it's faster, the better you are, basically. Like Challenger Junglers, I did a, this was like four day old data, but I looked at the top 20 solo queue of KR, NA, and EU West. There were eight top laners, 17 junglers, 13 mids, 13 80 carries, and nine supports. So you can still find success with the role. It's less powerful, still extremely powerful once you've perfectly optimized it, but the game is almost tricking you into farming because as you mentioned another way of phrasing it the less valuable a jungle camp is the better it is to just gank all the time so while the game is telling you to farm by saying all your camps are up you should actually not farm because everything else is higher value that's exactly that what sense. i said i know it sucks <laughs> like that just that mental trick is something that is very unnatural to me after like seven years of jungling and that's why because we have been through Many iterations Ten of, years of jungle. Ma exactly, many different jungle metas. As I was like, I've been top lane for. Yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> that's what I thought. I was just like, you see him smiling. He's like, you come top. But the the, the jungle changes the most, also of all roles. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been wildly different. You're most affected by map changes because you're everywhere on the map. Exactly, and it will always be. Uh, mm -hmm. To the earlier point, it will always be an impactful role because you can be anywhere at any time. So yeah, that, and we are preaching to the choir because they are buffing it. Yeah, yeah, like they are already saying the camp should be more valuable. So yeah. just just to take to play the devil's advocate a little bit and, and cancel the, the jungle pity party uh, as it's, you guys are going back and forth. <laughs> just, I, just a little bit. Just I little stopped bit. in for a minute, just but a little, I didn't um, stay. So to, to take the counterpoint, right, you know, the even with the nerf jungle, you know, LCS Pro is getting pulled. So this is just their opinion. Which role is the most impactful in professional play? Min lane was number one, 43% of the votes. Jungle, number two, 40.7% of the votes. We're not... So, 
saying I know, that I know, it's not, I know. Im- not I know. impactful. What I just said <laughs> is that but, jungler but, but being anywhere of, is always going to have all laners always feel like they're impactful, impacted by the jungle. I know. But a lot of people are saying that that jungle is the weakest role. When I look at social media, when I hear from even even pros. I will say jungle, jungle is, is incredibly weak. definitely not the weakest role. Yeah. So I, I think. My, my impression is jungle is no longer satisfying, but it is still strong, right? And I do think that some of the complaints are a bit overblown. I'm glad it's getting buffed, and I think rightfully so. It needs more experience. That just feels like way too bad. But jungle is still very impactful, um, and and I think we are still seeing that, you know, at the pro level. A lot of lanes are decided by that, and that's, you know, when I talk to pros, what their argument is for jungle still being, you know, really impactful mm-hmm. is simply that jungle decides the lanes, and the lanes are then, you know, what is kind of executing that lead and, and, and winning. And that's why I think that how they went about changing the, the jungle experience made it even probably feel worse for yeah, laners. Really because, unsatisfying. Right. So, like, laners, the reason they feel like jungle is so impactful is it shows up and screws their lane up. And so they're like, ah, jungle is the most impactful role. Yep. So let's take the XP down so they're not as strong. But all you did was increase their impact because now it's better to chain gank. And so for laners. Or at least if, their annoyance. Yeah, yeah, at least their annoyance. Maybe yeah, not yeah. quite impact, but you feel the jungler even more now because yep. he wants to be in your lane 24 yep. 7. When, so, my, when my lane's frozen on me and the jungler's just sitting there, the only thing I could do it, is is wait for my jungler. It's, it's just <laughs> exacerbated both people's problems. Junglers feel less satisfied. Well, playing. because it also makes jungle more linear, like you're talking about. Yeah. It's so clear that these depleted camps are of lower value. So, of course, if you're an efficiency jungler, you're always judging, well, it's way better for me to be in the lanes and getting that minion experience, which was actually buffed. Yeah. So, just to, to close it out, since we have had a pity party, for the people that want to continue to jungle so, and find success, would you like to restate your jungle tips? Because you can still win as jungle. I don't think also that it is a pity party. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a lot of jungle I, talk. It over feels last good. Our, our discussion, though, <laughs> is a very level discussion. Yeah. It was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And it's uh, all about how jungle sucks. Jungle party, <laughs> let's just say. <laughs> no, it's jungle. analysis of, of what and why. Yeah. And I have been through all of the jungle metas. That's why I'm t- I'm I'm started by talking about how I approach changes to the jungle. I found success. I had a 70% win rate at the beginning of this season mm-hmm. because of the way that I approach the changes to jungle. You look at the changes in efficiency and you adjust your play accordingly. Like it's like everyone is saying, it's unsatisfying to play yeah. this version, mm-hmm. but I'm trying to educate people on how to play this version. Yeah. You version. have to accept the things that are there. Exactly. And just Play That's the why new it's, game. it's mm-hmm. not a pity party. It's talking about You're how really to taking play. Exception um, with this. So what is interesting? Because uh, I think it's erroneous. That's why. Yeah, he doesn't like the phrase. We'll we'll, we'll say yeah. a different word. It's a rage. Uh, <laughs> is that what it is? The heavy jungle. Focus. I think in challenger and in pro, when people and everyone understands what's happened, it's not the weakest role. I actually wonder if for most players, if it is the weakest role, mm-hmm. because if you actually haven't adjusted to the new style, because you've built these patterns over the last six years, you're just going to be we- actually incredibly weak. So that's something we haven't necessarily experienced. Yeah, if you're like, I'm a Shivana jungle or a Graves yeah. jungle and I can't farm a ton or something like, and you're bad at invading. Very like, few people actually realize that Grump is more valuable than it was last season. That that was one of the things, realizing that people didn't even read the individual adjustments that I wanted to make the piece. Looking forward to your piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Uh, that obviously, you know, is a big topic in the meta, but you know, there, there is patch 10.2 coming up as well. Uh, is there anything that you guys think is, is looking pretty impactful from, from there? All of us go to, well, I'm just for, like, for yeah. me, I think, okay, well then I, I, I can touch a little bit on the Ziggs changes. I am a little bit worried about the Zig changes because anytime Ziggs in the meta, I just think that champion is so uninteresting to watch. It's such a stall out play for late game style champion. And when I was watching a lot of the LCS games, this past weekend, we already had so many games that felt like it was playing for soul. So I am a little bit concerned about that champion getting buffed, but it hasn't been in the meta for so long. Like I understand why um, they're, they're giving it a little bit of love because it's just no one plays Ziggs, it feels like, at all anymore. So, you know, it, it's getting some buffs on, on the E slow, the Q damage, and the knockback on the W is also getting larger. Mm-hmm. So you can kind of like knock people into your team a little bit more. So it does give Ziggs some more playmaking ability. Um, but I just don't really like the things he does to pro play, you know, kind of similar to, to Anivia and these types of champions mm-hmm. that just become so incredibly hard to see, John. And, you know, with, with people's kind of difficulty taking Baron, it feels like you, know, you only really take it after a team fight win in, these days. Um, 
that is usually the only way to kind of really see John's eggs. Yeah. I remember season five, I think it was, when games were like 50 minutes, easy hoon zigs, mm-hmm. you know, like those kinds of games were just a nightmare to watch. And so I don't want that to come back. I'm with you on that. Luckily, I think he, even if he becomes a stronger champion, I don't think the game state is necessarily great for him. It does feel a little too aggressive and about for jung- pro play. Yeah, for pro play. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think one that will affect pro play is uh, the Kiana change. W passive attack speed mm-hmm. now scales, and they start it at 5%. That is a death sentence in the jungle. Attack speed is so big mm-hmm. for jungle champions because your clear speed early on um, is a big part of getting to the point where you can go for ganks even. And if they're if they're making Kiana only a mid laner, that will have big ramifications for pro play. It's no longer this super powerful flex pick. Um, when you take away one of the roles, it is going to make it a lot easier in champion select to deal with it. So I'm actually curious to see if that will drop her down. Currently, she is up there almost permaban mm-hmm. um, for for uh, LCS games at least. Um, if you take off one of the roles, then there's a lot more options. The Kiana thing is so interesting to me because in pro play, it's played so much in the jungle. And I think the reason that they're actually just trying to kill jungle is that so they can buff it elsewhere for solo queue. Because the win rates are actually trash on this champion right now in solo mm-hmm. queue. Mm-hmm. And even for jungle, it's like a 41% win rate. But in the LPL, uh, you know, it was getting played nonstop in jungle. And obviously, it's getting chain ban in LEC and, L- and LCS. So... It is something that it's like the pro players are knowing how to make this work and playing really well around it. And I think it's almost gotten to that stage of like Azir and some of those champions where they have trash win rates but are really OP and pro and that it's like affecting how it is in solo queue. So mm-hmm. my guess is that's what they're hoping to do is take it out of the jungle and be able to change it in a way where it becomes, you know, pretty powerful for solo queue and not just more of a, a pro only pick. Yeah, I hope that it actually knocks Kiana out of permaban because at least following LCS, there were very static bans last week, which ended mm-hmm. up giving us a lot of like Ophelio Senna trades. And those are the 280 carries because our bans are full. Uh, one thing that I think we'll probably see play is Karma solo lane again. Oh no. I swear to God, every <laughs> yeah. time uh. this champion's base damages get changed at all, yeah. it's a solo lane pick. And 10 damage at rank one for Q. And ten damage on W, that's that's karma opportunity right there. That's a <laughs> that's a mid or top lane karma, especially with champions like Aphelios who are strong, mm-hmm. who are low mobility, but can benefit greatly from having those AP empowered shields. Karma's back. That, that, that's just what I think. Speaking of another jungler, would you like Xmithy's Trundle pick if it oh had these buffs my. on it? Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Let's that's, go. Would anyone want to see Trundle again? That also would... report that pick for week one. <laughs> you want to throw that one yeah, yeah, why didn't we? We did report it. No. I feel like somebody for sure no, reported no. it. No, no, no. Because it happened a couple days it, Oh, yeah, it would, ha- it yeah, would yeah, have yeah. to been uh, yeah. this episode because Report our, the trunk. 9x. Schedule. We're adding it in there. 9x. 9x. Uh, At least 4x. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that... <laughs> <laughs> All our teammates also reported yeah, it. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. for sure. Uh, but if it had these buffs, would, it, would you be more enticed a little bit? 10% on attack speed. Um no, it's movement speed. Uh, Frozen Domain already speed, has movement speed. speed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It uh, already has a me. lot of attacks. Move, movement speed is still very strong, but then also Pillar of Ice uh, scaling uh, 5%. Well, part of, flat 5%. Part of my outrage when he picked that champion, or when the team picked that champion, was I was like, the buff is on the way. At least wait for the buff to come <laughs> through. Uh, I still think I would be Again. dubious. If I see a mm-hmm. trundle pick like that, but at least I would have some sort of argument with, mm-hmm. hey, now he's got the buff with the extra move speed. And Nick Smithy, to give him credit and the team credit, he has been a very good trundle player. When trundle was in meta, mm-hmm. his pillar placement was extremely good. And that's about how I judge trundle skill because that's about how you show skill on that champ. Yeah. Uh, I still thought it was weird like even if it had been buffed because they were picking into a no tank team. Exactly. Right? So, I think I think Trundle should see some play when there are tanks when to, there's to the or on top or something. Right? Yeah, then I think it becomes really really valuable. But without that really big target to alt, you know, people talk a lot about how how much weaker it makes the opposing tank, but like Trundle is not tanky enough. You know, a poor Trundle jungle is not tanky enough, especially when you're doing the supportive style mm-hmm. items, unless you have someone to steal stats from that is really going to actually buff you up. So 
Uh, <laughs> that was me. My you want to everyone... take that call in front of the class? Is there? Well, so I didn't actually even get called, and my phone is on mute. But I guess I had an alarm set. Okay. For something, so the yeah. alarm went off uh, to remind me to uh, to pay rent. Uh, so yeah. Anyway, I think Trundle Trundle will be uh, will be back, but situationally, and 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 it does seem very jungle focused, right? Because it's speed up on on the W and it's slow down on the E. Um, so you, your your gangs. ganks become a little bit better. Sweet. On to LCS? Yeah, I think so. I think patch 2, 10-2 uh, is actually generally pretty small. Yeah. A lot of the changes that I think people have been waiting for are in patch 10-3. Man, just looking Kobe's at, excited about at that. the nerf changes, not even talking about any of the buff side, the nerf changes. Every champion on that list for the nerfs for 10-3 is looking real nice to me. I'm not as excited for the buffs. I guess we'll get into that later because yeah, yeah. that, that's yeah, in a couple that's weeks. But Azir Corky, snoozer, they're getting buffed. All right, we're going into overreactions for week one. What are your biggest overreactions of the week. I said I had a big one. Yeah. All right. Digs a top two team. Is that like mm. right now or will be? End of season. Both. So I talked to Lorlo and he was scrimming and who knew he wasn't here. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me that Dig is super underrated before LCS. Mm -hmm. But the players from teams always say that about their teams. Yeah. It gives it a little bit more credibility this is a big, now. This is a big overreaction though because uh, most like- Because two, top two is pretty so strong. So better two, yeah. than who, who else is in your top C9. two then? It's they're, gotta be- They C9. are in the conversation with the top two of C9 and TL. Okay. Yeah. By but then they're, they're top three. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, that's, if they're in the conversation- They are for sure better than one of them yeah. but they're in the conversation <laughs> with the other. <laughs> okay. They- it's, Got Calculator? It all comes three. back to the goddamn letter Q. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about this, Keanu. All right, so Q. All, 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 <laughs> top two team, list three teams. <laughs> yeah, so I don't necessarily want to debate uh, the pros and cons of like, oh yeah, TL yeah, won't come yeah, together because yeah, yeah, like yeah. there's a good chance TL struggles or there's a good chance C9 struggles. So they're definitely top three, I think. <laughs> I, you can tell by our reaction though that this seems pretty reasonable. Yeah. Just, no, no one was, we were debating, oh, which team are they better than? Yeah, no one was saying, week, oh, that's like, Which stupid. team jumped the most? Because this is a conversation I was having with Prawley on JLXP when I like tricked him into saying Dig was second best. Mm -hmm. is I was like, I was like, C9 was the best team in week one. He's like, well, they haven't really been challenged yet. And well, they didn't play, like, okay, well, who, who would challenge them then? Because mm -hmm. they've already beaten TL, right? Mm -hmm. He's like, well, sure, TL with Frosh. I'm like, all right, throw them out. Are they going to be challenged by TSM? Are they going to be challenged by CLG? And eventually he just said, oh, I guess Dig would challenge them then. Which means, yeah. like, Dig, if they can beat C9, they're top two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's why I think the Dig-TL match that's going to be coming up next week, which I'm sure we'll cover more later, is really important. But I, I think right now, two, top two makes sense. End of split top two is a little dicier for me. Yeah. That's... <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it's overreaction segment. Yeah, so, I guess. I want to talk about why. Because this is not yeah. unjustified. You're talking about it being an overreaction and people, if you didn't watch the games, might be like, yeah, that is an overreaction. But I think that even in the small sample size, there's some really good evidence that we can have to go off of. It's not a, a, an unreasonable overreaction. Right. You go down the list and you're talking about all of the perceptions that people had about this team and all the worries that they had. Oh, yeah, is Froggen and Hooney going to clash mm -hmm. over the t way to play the game or the resources in the game? No. Clearly, Hooney, very willing to play multiple styles, and it's not just, oh, he built tank on Renekton. He's willing to take a backseat. He also still brings the Hooney beast gangplank, control the side lane, ultimates, winning team fights. Froggen did exactly what you want out of Froggen, absolutely crushed it from the mid lane. And the biggest questions of all, this rookie Johnson. bottom side really Johnson good. paired with Aframu, who people were rightly uh, speculating mm -hmm. on from last year. Awesome. Well, I was going to say, I thought the biggest question mark was actually going to be Grig. Uh, but <laughs> I said, go down the whole list. I didn't do the whole list. Okay, well, okay. I, Kobe, I, that, jungle is really weak right now, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> I, right? yeah, I used up <laughs> really? I think it's the most my impactful. allocation Did of, you hear about the pro jungle talk? They think it's actually the most impactful. Well, so <laughs> I think one thing that's working well for Greg's favor is by playing around people like Hooney who have really strong opinions. It helps flow chart potentially. Like Hooney and Frog have an idea how they want to play the mm. game already, and it's probably a little bit more about playing through them. Like when Lyra was not just being like, like he, Lyra's jungle Scarner proximity bot. went right up. Yeah, when he was not Scarner bot, he was struggling more. But then it's like, listen, you're going to be the tanky guy and you're going to go around and support the lanes. Lyra looked a lot better. And I think that's something that's happening with Grig a little bit where they have a pretty well-developed 
game plan, so to speak, about who the carries are and what people need to do to help them out. And it makes his job easier. And he's doing a good job right now. So I will give a little objection because, you know, <laughs> it, what you're saying, you're saying it makes it easier. You know, it's like a good thing that he can just be told what to do by a soul lanes. But people use that as such a negative as soon as things go bad, right? It's like, Brainless jungler, doesn't know where to go, doesn't know what to do. I would so, say... So if he is being piloted by Huni, I don't think that's a good thing because I don't think that can work long-term because as as you guys have talked about, jungle is such a dynamic role. The situation is never always the same mm -hmm. and you have to be able to figure out when to go where, when to just like top lane is gangrene. Sorry, Huni, I can't come up there. I've got to do other things. And so I hope he is using his own... A knot. lot of the reasons you just said are why I was like, Top two end of split <laughs> uh, because <laughs> Brig has not performed on the LCS stage mm -hmm. that well before. And so if things are easier at the start of the split because of these reasons, that's why I think they, they look really good right now. My question is, if the meta changes in jungle and he needs to be less gank focused and more you know, farm oriented and then it's, it's a more efficient game plan, he needs to have a much stronger opinion on what he needs to be doing at that moment. Maybe this never comes to fruition, but that's that's my concern right now. Is if it is like the Hootie Frog and Show, what happens after that? Mm -hmm. See, I yeah, I I'm not worried. I'm glad that you mentioned Grig because I have been definitely one of the biggest people that was saw him when he was on stage with TSM. Big critic, right? Mm -hmm. And I was very skeptical of mm -hmm. him being the starter on Dig, mm -hmm. but I think he did a very very good job. Uh, and it actually doesn't make me worry that he did it in this type of jungle. Um, because one of the, of course, the big point, and we'll just put it to bed now, all this jungle talk, like, I think the biggest problem is that people are kind of making these oversimplifications and they're just like, there's two camps, ah, jungle pity party or ah, jungle is ruined. But if you examine the actual changes and you still play well within these constraints, I think it is a good thing. If he's being told what to do, that's never a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Overreaction, Mark? You got one? Uh, overreaction, CLG is definitely not making playoffs. I would bet the house right now. They're doomed. You bet the house. Bet the house. I don't have a house. Your parents' house? Okay, I'll... so what's more likely? <laughs> dig top... You got a house in <laughs> LA? <laughs> no house. What's more likely? Dig top three or CLG missing playoffs? I think, I think top three. Dig top three. Whoa. Yeah. Yep. CLG looked bad. They did look bad. They looked really they bad. They were and the biggest losers. The people who would contest dig for third did not look good either. Whereas... I think there's six playoff looking teams after the first week where I'm like, oh yeah, these people will be good. I don't see who's going to break, like who easily looks like they'd break into top three over Dig, whereas I don't know how CLG gets back. Yeah, CLG looked really bad. And and I think the other thing that's just going to be, you know, my overreaction, which I'm assuming someone's going to say, is, you know, TSM, most disappointing start ever. You know, this is, I think, one of the reasons people are more willing to say, yeah, Dig could be top three is because the team that a lot of people mm -hmm. had in the top three mm -hmm. did not look good. And that's TSM, mm -hmm. right? Their their first game was pretty depressing against the Mortals, right? Where, you know, they kind of drafted themselves a stronger early game comp. They misexecuted in a few different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, they, their macro wasn't great. And they failed around these key points. And then they had really no options coming to late game because they, they had no way to actually engage and actually start fights. And they, mm -hmm. they lose this really long game. And then they lose again to TL, which is obviously a really hard opponent, but it is TL with Shurnfire, right? And when people are expecting you to compete against this team, it's going to be a much higher level team with Broxa later in the split when you are practiced. And that's not even just player skill difference. Broxa is a better jungler than Shurnfire. I think that is clear. But TL also has very little practice. The team as a whole is just going to no get boot better. Camp. <laughs> and TSM is one of the most practiced teams on the other side, right? So, you know, I, I think that it looks grim for, for TSM also. And, and that makes room for you to think, hey, Dig could be top three. I have... I wanted to almost devil's advocate TSM and COG because I feel like I've done almost nothing but just say how embarrassing their losses are, which they... Are like I think TSM's loss to Immortals was one of the most embarrassing game one losses possible because mm -hmm. before that game, Immortals was unanimously the worst team in the league, and then they lost to them, and then the TL and then the TL game as you mentioned just no mid game sense whatsoever. They had a large lead that they threw away, but for CLG, even though they boot camped in Korea, Crown had visa issues and we don't know exactly how long he was away from the team. Because even if you boot camped, if you get rusty uh, and don't practice with him for a week before the LCS, 
you might look a little out of sorts. Yeah, that's why you would flash EQ into mid lane after. Uh, totally. <laughs> um, oh, okay, can we talk? I, the, yeah, let's the, talk the, specifics because I always yeah. want to get into the actual plays that that cause these opinions that we're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And for me, some of the biggest things that stood out to me because of the communication story being so big for CLG. The communication I was, was really bad. Yeah, I was looking forward to a coordinated team. I was like, all right. Like they made a lot of these changes in the mind for, for that. And with a lot of the plays, especially with their uh, team comp that had Leona and Orn in it, um, they would oftentimes have Smoothie Leona going one way and the team going the yeah. other way. Now, you can't. You got to be in team comps to dissect what's going on mm -hmm. in there for the minutia. But when you see that aftermath on stage and the, you're engaged, Leona is in and everybody else is out, that is not what we were expecting. It was it was just awful communication. The one thing I will say about CLG is they were willing to try. Like they were willing to make five-man engages happen. And if they were together, a lot of those engages could have worked. Whereas I feel like if you're going over to some of the TSM things, they looked coordinated in their inaction, if that makes sense. Like they were seemingly on the same page in not being able to manage waves or, or make team fights happen, if that makes sense. So the the CLG one shows a little room for improvement, even if I think they're a very fringe playoff team at this point. So I will say, you know, and, and this is why I mentioned the TSM thing, like being bad as an overreaction, you know, in that kind of section, because Bjergsen A did say he was he was pretty sick. Uh, he came out on Twitter and said he was sick this week, and, and you know his team almost carried him, kind of thing. So, you know there there is going to be a, an issue there. I would also say, despite the fact that Teal had Shurnfire, I did like the adjustments that TSM made from game one to game two. Right? People criticized a lot of the inaction and a lot of the inability for them to have multiple ways to win the game in their game one draft, no engage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. And in game two, you know, I, I discussed this during the draft. It looked like it was set up for a very easy Tom Kench pick, right? But they actually, you know, skipped that. Instead of playing the defensive side, they decided to take the Leona. Mm -hmm. And I thought, to be fair, TSM did try a lot of engages, but TL handled them really, really well, you know, utilizing, you know, the the feathers from Zaya, the Oriana ball, and all these things to create zones of control to essentially isolate Biofrost from the rest of his team. So even with Shurnfire, I thought TL played great down the stretch in that game. And so that one was less concerning to me. And I still do think that, you know, if TSM played their game two in their game one spot, they probably win pretty easily because I don't think many teams can can handle the engage as well as TL did. And TL kind of showed why, you know, they are world class. But it is still really concerning. This is a perfect time for my overreaction, mm. which is not a team or a player based. Um, this is about the meta base. Overreaction. We the jungle. No, no, no. <laughs> it has not... Well, it's okay. It slightly does uh, because it's, about <laughs> it's, not, it's not. It's not about what regular jungle though. Okay, overreaction. We need to speed the game back up. Yeah. The the balance right now. We thought that Dragon Souls were going to be like, all right, boom, the game is over after that. Clearly not. No. Um, uh -huh. And by the side effect of um, weakening the early dragons, the one of the very strong strategies that has emerged is okay. We play for turret plate money and rift heralds and lane dominance rather than dragon control early up until you get two or three dragons. And then we are stronger than you in a five on five because we have opted for that strategy so we can deny your fourth soul dragon. This actually ends up extending the game with multiple weak dragons because then the other team gets a bunch of dragons mm -hmm. before getting to a dragon soul. So in, in the weird world where we tried to add something with that is game ending powerful buff of Dragon Soul. We actually extended the amount of time that you have these weak buffs of so weaker dragon. Elder Dragon is the game ending buff. Dragon Soul is just a permanent. Dragon Soul was also yeah. wasn't supposed to be game ending, but yeah. it is supposed to, it is a powerful buff. But, okay, so you know who so I I agree that the game was slow. Yeah. Um I do think it will speed up, especially if Senna ADC gets nerfed. So I think there's compounding factors here. I think Baron having more health is slowing things down. But team compositions not having Baron damage is extra slowing things yeah. down. Well, like, like the, CSM's comp against the The Senna Tom Kent stuff with LeBlanc, and like you look at all the Orn that's being played, like all mm -hmm. these things that really suck at killing Baron. Baron's actually the game ending buff, like in a sense. It's the for game sure, accelerator. Sure. And it's just, it is already harder to take, and it is exacerbated by these non 
late game scaling junglers, right? Like a yep. Jarvan isn't killing Baron fast. It's just if you want to go down the teams rabbit, can't even try it. Sometimes. If you want to go down the rabbit hole, it gets even further because you don't have mountain buff yeah. doesn't help do it anymore. Yep. Like you're saying, yeah. the numbers are lower. So just even if you did have the same champions from before, yeah. it's more difficult. I think the only thing you would need to change is a Senna nerf and Baron having like a thousand less health. I also say the I would think a lot of the rift changes also make it harder to do traditional Baron setups. I think hmm. losing walls to pin people against off turns, going over the red wall, um, just by being able to run straight out. Mm -hmm. The shrines moving people faster as the ones checking the Baron. Mm. Uh, you could argue... Covering all vision with the extra brushes. All, all vision makes it hard to get proper vision control. Uh, I would say every single one but Mountain probably makes Baron yeah. slightly harder to do. And I think when you put all these factors together, you get these mm -hmm. longer games. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it is interesting because the most extreme example of kind of what you're talking about mm -hmm. was really the TSM TL game where there was actually seven dragons taken, right? Before mm -hmm. before an elder yep. spawned because they lost the first three and then TL started getting stronger in team fights and they just took one after one after one. And I mean, you know, in that game, maybe it would have looked very different if there wasn't that that lost dragon that Jensen actually got. But still, you know, that did push back the elder really, really far. And also, I hated watching Senna ADC. Yeah, yeah. why is that? I just, I just felt like while it's a really fun champion to play, it was so unexciting to watch, and it didn't. It's so slow. It's just like so safe. the The high moments <laughs> weren't weren't really fun to watch, and it, and it also, Pew. like because Laser. pro because pro play was so is is so much slower and less interactive mm -hmm. than scrims and also solo queue. The amount of souls and the late game power that Senna had, that kind of promise of the infinite scaling, I never felt the payoff. Even in that 60 minute game I where TS a little bit. TSM was playing it, I, you, you should feel like, oh, this is a six item guy he sold his boots for a Triforce. He should have 7,000 stacks. Of six, you know, it didn't mm -hmm. feel like I ever saw Senna just taking over a game. I agree, and I, uh, for me, I look at the archetype of the champion. Your trading power that you're used to seeing that's super exciting of big crits and attack speed. Uh, by the design of the champion, which is totally cool that they want to make this completely mm -hmm. different archetype, their power is not invested in those two areas. It's invested in range, which is also a very powerful stat. Mm -hmm. And as we're seeing, one of the most powerful stats, mm -hmm. having incredible range towards the late stages of the game, on top of all this lethality, lends to um, these super long and more safe approaches uh, to that style of play. Whereas speed and crits are always way more exciting just to watch. What about <laughs> what about just that super general theory? Well, it's also shielding and heals. Like, <laughs> shield, you, you yeah, probably exactly. have higher it's, AD Remember, ratio. it's supposed to be a support. Yeah. It was designed as a support. Yeah, you would normally have higher ratios probably on your Q and R if they were not also shielding and healing as you use them. Yeah. The damage on Q is not that particularly impressive when you it's watch like an I, auto attack. I just think yeah. Senna AD carry is OP. Like, I think... Yeah, uh, it is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. But, it but it's OP in well in LCS. It doesn't mean ways. it's not OP, yeah. but it didn't actually have as much success as I expected. Because I thought it was going to dominate, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it would 3 and 5. You know, obviously, it's small sample size, not indicative completely of power, but uh, I, I was surprised at, at what I felt like uh, was kind of like a lack of how, how effective mm -hmm. it, it would be, you know, yep. especially in the slow games. I was thinking this is going to be Senna's bread and butter. Yep. Find a route, heal your team, run around. Mm -hmm. yep. All right. New fun uh, way to go about it as well. Tracking individual players through next week. I have a player to nominate that was almost um, on my overreaction, but Froggen. I want to track him going forward, and it, my possible overreaction was going to be Froggen is now top two mid laner because we've also had mid laners drop out. Bjergsen's not going to be up there anymore, that type of stuff. How many think? mini Froggens will Froggen win this split? With Ooh. Every time he gets a player of the week, Ooh. he gets, he gets a mini pose, Frog, right? Oh, yeah. So if you're I a real. <laughs> mine's over there. I want to go get if it. If you're a real no. baller, go get it, Kobe. Do it. Yeah, sure. It. Run, Kobe. Yeah. Mark said, Run. Mark said no. I'm just no. I'm jealous. That was jealousy yeah. speaking. I don't have Yeah, yeah. why do you get to be the demo? Why did Kobe get to get the action figure? I want He's to I'm the best. I just start practicing that. poses. Yeah. So, Co if, Kobe's if first you're a real baller, what you do, you start, you know, you start doing like one and then you start like counting oh, up on, on your, your poses, you know? <laughs> you see? This is true. So, 
you know, the, the ultimate. If you're a real baller, you have one of these? No. True. You, you do numbers <laughs> because you're going to get one. So that's a bunch for the MasterCard times. player of the week. They get a 3D printed. They get a mini, a mini figure of themselves. Can I see that? I saw, yeah. I saw a picture of Mark holding it, but I never actually got to see it up close. It's pretty good up close. It's, it's How mad would you be if I just like. Shh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> pretty mad. Pretty mad. <laughs> Technically, that's not so pretty cool. LCS, so I'm never, I'm yeah. always going to be like, where is that thing? So you can never take it. I will say you look like a little bit more of a Grandpa Kobe. You got you got a bunch of lines. That's true. You know? I'm a boomer. Yeah, but, but they don't have the lines here. Let me see. Yeah. But the, that's really cool. And Froggen looked damn good. Yeah. So I think uh, I think he is one to watch. That was one I wanted a to dude. call out too. Maybe I mean he, a real he was, two, not not a not a out of or three. he was for sure <laughs> top two level this week. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So if if he can maintain this level of play, but I think that's a big ask. I don't think he will be top two by the end of the split because I think we have seen Bjergsen and Jensen be so damn good for so friggin' long that those guys. Are almost guaranteed to be at the top, and but I do think that you know Niski and and Froggen, yeah. those are the two that I'm looking at with potential to break in. Mm -hmm. And I will say even Jazuke because I think his LeBlanc game was really damn impressive, and if he can put on more LeBlanc games and less those Zier games, you know th that is the kind of game where like he was such a difference maker, right? It was almost like EG was playing what TSM played in their first game, and it looked night and day. And I felt like mostly that was because Jizuke was everywhere, poking people out, playing very aggressively, and, and just making things happen. Yeah, I think it's going to be a mid lane discussion probably because my player to watch is Crown. And we talked a little bit about some of the Vicious stuff maybe and how much time they really have to practice even though they got that boot camp. Are they in sync or not? But he was supposed to be the really, really monster pickup. And everyone's super high on him. He was hotly contested in the offseason. And I think sometimes how well someone works in a team gets really ignored way too hard. And that's one of the things that was always a problem with Froggen. People always said, oh, his teammates suck, of course. But I also think from talking with other people, that was not like a good team synergy either. It wasn't like, oh yeah, we're not that great, but we're elevating each other. Because we've seen teams do that, you know, mm -hmm. fly quests and stuff in the past and, and different immortals where Smithy joins and suddenly it's it's an insanely different roster. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's kind of what I'm scared of for Crown right now. Whereas as much as we all know he's a great player, maybe he's not a great player for CLG or for this lineup. Or maybe CLG is not a great team for him because they look disastrous like we already said. And I want to see if this guy who's hyped up can actually solo carry games because he didn't necessarily do that a ton for Optic. He did it sometimes, but early season I think he did with the Vladimir and the TF in in the early weeks. He I thought he hard carried a handful of their games. Yeah, he's done it sometimes, but not enough to like be a great playoff team or even yeah. even a top five team in the league. Uh, and if this is going to be like Optic was last split, where nothing is really gelling that well and they're kind of all over the place, I don't. Uh, that's why I'm scared that they're going to miss playoffs. I have one. Okay. This is like, we're just basically doing player over reactions. Um, uh, or teams. Well, it's just team. to watch. It's just, yeah. no, it's Players just to, yeah, watch. to watch. Okay. For, uh, you could do a team. I want to watch Double Lift carefully next week because I think Double Lift's poor play in week one was overlooked due to Shurnfire being their jungler. His. I saw him getting flamed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, was it? Yeah. I mean, it's double lift. There's yeah, going to be a thousand good. people saying both things. But I think for the most part, uh, like, I think double lift has been the best 80 carry in the LCS for like three years and will likely be the best by the end of the split. But I thought week one was bad. Uh, I thought the Zven lane into Zven Vulcan, I thought they lost that lane fairly handily when they had opportunities to win. And then the early laning phase against TSM, because they won the game, like, they, they got just bopped like the first gank um you can argue like he actually flashed late he flashed late mm -hmm. on the leona e as the elise was shown on award so that was slow reaction time which is very rare from double lift and then immediately died again because dardock did the loop around gank that should be gg for most teams obviously he wasn't punished but i thought double lift played poorly in week one and you're not talking about it because everyone's like, oh, if they lose, it's because of Shurnfire. Yeah. If they lose, it's also because of Double Lift with the way he's currently playing. The other side of the coin is, though, despite dying twice in that lane, it was up 20 CS over Kabe. I know. I was, that was the weird thing about that game is that TL just understands how wave management worked. Yeah. And TSM doesn't seem to value that skill. I was going to say a lot of that CS deficit came from what felt like <clears throat> lane swaps and moving around a little bit. Uh, because everyone right now, eight minutes, you swap top after whoever got the first dragon, and you start doing that stuff, and TL moved around the map better, and that's actually where he got more of his advantage. And I think Impact actually 
if I remember correctly, fell around 20 CS behind. Yeah, but Jensen was like 70 up on Bjergsen and then double lift. By the end of the game, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And it's not super complicated where that comes from. You guys are mentioning it's managing the side waves yeah. towards the mid stages of the game. And TSM were focused on getting those dragons stacking yeah. for the big payoff of the dragon soul that we're talking about being mm -hmm. powerful. And then they get outscaled before that point. The critical fight is the fight. Fourth Drake fight. Exactly. Yep. So the player I, I kind of have an eye on, and, and it is a bit through a negative lens, which I kind of feel bad about, but it's Kumo. Um, I think he may have been the lowest impact player in the league in week one. So game one, in as far as LCS, 0-3-0. Not, not even one assist. He was very far down, uh, got kind of run over by Huni's gangplank. Game two, he does finish the game three and one on Mordekaiser, but two of the kills were as Nexus was dying, and the only other kill he got at any point really during the game was actually ulting the opponent's support who was 20% after they had taken Baron. Like, he essentially went through two full LCS games without even getting an assist. Both games, he mismanaged his wave very heavily in lane. In the Mordekaiser game, he, he fell down, like, 20 CS early by essentially freezing the wave on himself, by over-pushing and not being able to get it to the turret, and then, you know, not having confidence to actually shove that in. And, like, that is someone that I've been pretty, pretty kind of worried about as far as EG's overall success coming into this season because I was really not impressed with his laning last year. Uh... It feels like even more of a red flag for me now. They did win a game, obviously, but it didn't feel like it was anything to do with him, and he still looked like he was exploited in that game. So I, I am watching him because I do think he needs to step it up uh, if, if they're going to do much. Well, you said lowest impact. Is that including negative impacts? Because I think people had, <laughs> I think people had worse weeks than so, him. But if you want to yeah. say in terms of just that, like that's what I mean, just like yeah. it's like he it's, wasn't it's even invisible. There. Yeah, like okay. like not he wasn't involved in anything. So yes, other people played worse for sure because okay. he wasn't actively just like, like inting, dragging them into the ground. Right, you know, mm -hmm. maybe a little bit in the first game. You know, he he didn't play so well. The second game, he was kind of just there. Um, but like, can you actually do well in a season? With with someone playing like that, and that's kind of my my question because Jazuke popped off, Bang in the second game was massive, right? Like it felt like they had so many things going for them, which allowed him to kind of just exist. Mm -hmm. In many other games, I felt like that top lane differential could have could have meant a lot. You know what his kill participation was for the week? What seventeen percent? Yeah, and that's with picking up two kills at yeah, the yeah. nexus. That would have been lower. Uh, like he, <laughs> so, like he got both those kills as the game ended. You can. Abandon your top lane and win games. Absolutely. But and abandoned top laners are still usually involved in team fights. That's true. All right. He, well, I, I was just going to say that Mordecai is a great pick. As soon as they locked that in, I was talking to probably on, on the desk. I was like, perfect more Kumo. People should play Mordecai. Perfect Kumo pick. You know, just you kind of just there. You're hard to dive. A number of times, multi man ganks came to him. And they just didn't work. They were too slow. You, it's hard to dive a Mordekaiser with only two people because he just ults mm -hmm. one in. Um, so that's a great Kumo champ, and hopefully they can find some more. I think Aatrox will probably be okay, and then maybe something else. Um, I personally like looking ahead to next week mm -hmm. at a couple matches, and we do have some time. So we have picked out Dignitas, Team Liquid, and I have a bonus one if we decide we like this uh, part. <laughs> Sorry, what was So it? we're going to preview Dignitas Team Liquid for next week. Yeah. Because that is an exciting matchup. Mm -hmm. You're talking about, is it an overreaction for Dig to be top two? Well, play Team Liquid now. And this is Team Liquid after an extra week of practice. Most excited thing I am for in that matchup is Froggen versus Jensen. Yes. Because Jensen was the one who carried that game to me against TSM, along with like wave management and stuff. But his Oriana was just like so incredibly off. solid. That's why I want, we should enable blind pick for this game mode. And, <laughs> like they had old Why would you ever want to see Oriana versus Oriana? Because that's where you're going with this. Skill, skill matchup. <laughs> they, they both have phase rush. They both have, they can't even slow each other. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I was kidding. And that's, that's in a game where you always have the classic like double lift versus Aphromu matchup and Aphromu with his new AD carry. Uh, whereas double lift is still laning with, you know, MVP core JJ. Uh, so just tests all around. Like I think even though we actually had this discussion uh, earlier, but like some people say, hey, I, I wouldn't want to play Team Liquid now because if even if we beat them, we don't get credit. 
I would absolutely want to play Team Liquid now because they don't have Broxa. Like, I can win. Yeah, you yeah. get credit. I see the one in the win column over yeah, right uh-huh. there. That's credit. Uh-huh. <laughs> that shit counts. You can make playoffs <laughs> off that. We have yeah. a lot of teams that end up being a game or two out of playoffs, right? You know, yeah. it is a big deal to to actually get them or a game or two out of a bye. Yeah. Uh, I'm always uh, really excited to, to to watch top lane. I, th- I think Huni at his best is kind of, you know, the unstoppable force and Impact <laughs> at his best is kind of the immovable object. So I always think it's a good test for Huni to see how he can perform against, you know, the, the guy that, Everyone points to as as the best kind of defensive top laner in the league, guy who is the best weak side player, who's so hard to get advantages against. Because, you know, when I when I've been watching Huni stream lately, he's, he's spamming Lucian top, he's playing, you know, Rumble is playing a lot of these picks, and while they're not always getting through in LCS, you know, he is a guy who who can really extend advantages. Um, but impact is if you talk to any top laner, it's like they say you pick the winning matchup. And it's just even every time against Impact. So it'll be interesting to see who can kind of uh, get the best out of that. Yeah, all three lanes are really good. Like you said, both those guys. Then obviously, former, there's like so many storylines if you want to attach them. Mm-hmm. Former SKT top laners, won one worlds, one came up just short. The bot lane stuff already between Doublelift and Aphromi, like you said. As well as Johnson's supposed to be the, the promising up-and-comer going up against what's hands down the best. Like all that stuff is really, it's, really I, powerful. So here's an extension of my overreaction. Dig's going to win that game. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I think. Man, reason- you guys are so reasonable. By this I, I mean, I can very oh. easily go to bat for Team Liquid, but it's not an overreaction. I say that's a reasonable argument okay. to go after. So I, if, if they had Brox and they yes. were practiced, I would say no. Okay. Yeah. Because it's not just like oh, Brox is better. It's also where a lot of us would put probably the biggest question mark on Dig is with Grig, mm. and if mm. you're biggest mismatch is missing its guy, then that sways the matchup a lot for me. Whereas I think it's not just, oh, Team Liquid's not as good as they'll be in the future. It's also really important in this specific matchup. Plus, of course, that bottom lane where I'm going down the checklist, I'm like, oh yeah. And, uh, you know, the rookie Johnson and Aphromoo, they're fine bottom lane. That's great. Everybody who had questions about that, they're uncertain. Completely solved after week one. Yeah. Uh, you go up against Double F and Court uh-huh. JJ, all of a sudden, everybody's got that question. And yeah. what I don't care what your homework was, what your past work was leading up to this. <laughs> that's getting put to the test. And I, and I think you have to play, you know, such a dominant game, take down TL, which, which is always what makes it very difficult because their lanes are so good. They can just win the game through laning. But they're also, as we saw in the TSM game, so good at setting up team fights and avoiding mistakes, right? Because in, in a game where, where TSM started three dragons to zero... And it's Infernal Soul. You you feel like at some point you have four chances to get the soul. You feel like at some point the other team's gonna mess up. You're gonna get a pick. You're gonna get a, a dragon off that. You know from a smite seal or from something. And it just didn't happen against TL. And I think that's one of the things that you know makes them such a good team is they always have proper vision set up. Their timings are really good for when they're actually like resetting for objectives. They're always very organized and it feels like very on the same page yeah. when it comes to team fights. I got something for you to watch the next time TL plays. Okay. When the enemy burns flash, Core JJ kills them in the next five minutes. Like, he is the best player at punishing. I know it's not, like, this novel thing to know flash timers. Mm-hmm. Like, everyone times them. But, like, I feel like it's so present in TL's minds when they're going to be able to flash. Like, every time Biofrost flashed and he'd go to Contested Control Ward, they were pushing him off. Yeah. It was it was just very That's impressive. how they got back in the game is two yeah. Biofrost picks. Yeah. Okay, I did like that section. So bonus one. Okay. And this is a I'm gonna give you my prediction two seconds after you tell me the teams. Okay. This is this is a more sad take on this uh on this little game. Now that TSM and CLG are both lower skill, are you excited for the TSM CLG I game? Am because very previously, excited. previously, TSM. previously <laughs> <laughs> Previous, previously, people are like, I no longer care about this rivalry because CLG has dropped out of competitiveness with TSM. And then TSM drops down and you're like, if they're both 03 when that happens on Monday Night League. not doing that well. Da, da, da. <laughs> are you more excited? No. So Get me excited. Uh, I'm just Monday Night League with bottom dwelling, former <laughs> glory faded. <laughs> oh. You know, like, uh, I just can't. I am excited. I love I, watching I am, yeah. the salt and the like comments after struggling teams continue to struggle. I mean, like, the, that is just the a, memes are always pleasure. great where it's like the one with like the people with the hoodies on just all sitting on the ground, you know, where they're all just feels bad, yeah. man. I've thought about this though. I'll tell you why TSM's weakness counters CLG's weakness. Ooh. Yeah. Because CLG's weakness is disorganized, overforced team fights. TSM's weakness is a poor Doing ability nothing. to find fights. 
They're just going to win. <laughs> See, we're just going to walk into them and they're going to smack We have the hard counter style. We have a- <laughs> it's it, a hard weakness counter. It sounds funny to say this is a hot take, but just because TSM is going to inflame so much on this episode, but I think TSM is going to look really good in week two and it's going to 2-0. I think sure. we're over. I think-, I, I, think, I think their second game against TL actually beats almost every team in the league and that that was more TL playing well than TSM playing poorly. And, uh, and and I still have some faith mm, that I would, TSM is going to bounce back. I would say one. if we look back at one thing in this episode at the end of the, the year and we're like, haha, we were dumb, it's probably how hard we were roasting TSM this episode more than like... And it was in the dig. overreaction segment, Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. I know. Yeah. Like, if there's one thing that we look back and be like, yeah, that was an overreaction, it's probably the TSM one. I think because I'm, I'm more sold on Dig and less like CLG and some of the other things we're talking about. Yeah, week one practice and prep is some of the just most difficult possible thing to do. Like every sport, not only LCS, is like a copycat league. So the fact that LCK hasn't started yet, the fact that LPL looks so disorganized, the fact that by the time Saturday happened, there'd been like one other day of pro games to pull from in LEC. Like everyone is just like whatever their first guess of practice was. And yes, you can say it's a skill to like actually know what the best champions are, but 90% of teams figure out what their picks are based on what other people do. That's just a fact. Yeah. Uh, it's true in the NFL and the NBA as well, how those things work. So sometimes those week one things that are wrong are actually correctable. Where's Pantheon? Yeah. It's, you know, 90% presence in LEC. One game in L- LCS. Maybe next week everyone's learned to play Pantheon. It really changes how things are going for teams. And Pantheon is a user that can use Omnistone, which I saw I was getting some oh, more Omnistone. changes to make it even better. What's the change? I hope they remove Omnistone so Jat stops telling me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you about Double Omnistone. Omnistone. Yeah. yeah uh, <laughs> What's the change? Is it the one where you can... That's the, that's the one I saw. Okay. So you, you can actually that? block out a keystone, which is going to be yeah. amazing. Because getting Conquer on an Omnistone user is atrociously sad. Because it doesn't proc the Omnistone unless you max stack the Conquer. Mm-hmm. So I'm just going to turn it off and I'll never get Conquer. And getting Aftershock on Bard, also not that good for laning. Would you rather have Conquer or Aftershock on Bard, though? I don't know. You're going to turn off. I would, rather, I would rather have Conquer. Okay. I think I, but, I think I would. So at you, least I'm still getting some benefit from it while I'm not proccing. I'm really it. glad we're talking about this. Um, the the, the counter argument is that you can get rid of aftershock quicker. <laughs> yeah, if you hit a stun, yeah. right? But I yeah. just always feel like as soon as I see that pop over my head, <laughs> they start laning defensively, and I'm like, you're well, thinking okay. time to troll. <laughs> I'm stunning someone and I'm running in. <laughs> Why are we talking about Omnistone? <laughs> what about bar? Omnistone Draven? Stop if asking like about that, Omnistone. Like yeah, stand aside prox aftershock. It's the professional League of Legends podcast. We're not talking. No one's playing. If it gets good enough, you're going to see a lot of it. Not on Bard in bot lane. I was well, watching Bard, Lolo Bard play Omnistone Kale. Yeah, but I'm saying, dude, you know what I'm saying. Omnistone <laughs> Kale coming you know to I'm Academy saying. near you. Okay. I seen yeah. a, I seen a lot of players playing it in solo queue testing. Yeah. So yeah. testing, yeah. experimenting. All right. Twitter questions. Uh, we have one here from David Peterly, who has sent us about 10 million questions. I know. Uh, over I'm, the years, I've asked this for like two years. Is it Peter Lee? Yes. We, we saw okay. him. He came to the studio. He came yeah. to the stu- I didn't meet him? Yeah. Damn it. He said- Maybe he intentionally avoided you because you mispronounced his name. Maybe. He, he also did, was I, like, I, I really want to meet all of you yeah. except for Jat. <laughs> I don't like says the, it wrong. And by the way, he listens to every episode, so he's listening right yeah, now. Yeah, David Peterly like, is a very God, dedicated don't fan. listen to them. I really wanted to meet you too. He said okay, he didn't like yeah. the JLXP, and that's why. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's the question. He actually asked me where you were, and I was like, yeah. I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'll, I'll answer a David Peterly question on the next episode of JLXP. <laughs> okay. All right, sweet. It'll just be the only one you take. Yeah, you can just actually. answer a dive question on He's the JLXP. most dedicated, engaging viewer. He's earned it. There you go. All right. <laughs> what will it take to get a mixed gender pro team? Will it shift away from gaming houses and stuff? Uh, towards independent living situations with training facilities make a difference? It seems like LCS is the best possible place to encourage non-male pros. Oh, I think Korea or China will be the first region to have non-male pros. Well, they, There was just a big thread about... Yeah. Well, you know about INTZ's uh, player on the team. Yeah, I can't mm-hmm. remember her name. Uh, it's I'm going to mess it up. I I'm think it's Google Mayumi. It. That's so Ma- right. Mayumi or something? It's yeah. Something along those lines. Oh, yeah. I yeah. search, I type in INTZ, it's the first thing that comes up. Did I get the name INTZ right? INTZ Miami. Yes. Yeah. The question is, what will it take? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, my, my like longer answer is it takes like a ground up um, popularity of games amongst females to be much higher. And it's tr- much more tr- closer to being at parity in China and Korea, 
which is why I think long term, like I'm not talking about one. I'm talking about like to have a lot of female pro gamers. Mm-hmm. It's it's much more likely to happen in China or Korea. Um, I can't say. I mean, maybe this is not the right way to go, but did anyone see any of the drama that happened just like today or a day ago involving Mayumi and uh, Lep? No. no. Uh, I mean, this is kind of lame, but like basically he just said some dumb stuff on on his Twitch stream. Um, and it's just like, I think that's the kind of stuff that can hurt a lot mm-hmm. that you really need to cut out because like Jet's saying about getting it from the ground up is you need females who just want to play the game for fun and enjoy the community and the environment and all these different things and like stuff like that yeah is really detrimental and so beyond some of the logistical stuff like getting a gaming house that can separate work and living and those kinds of mm-hmm. things that you know he, the the question was about i think the culture things still need to evolve a little bit more mm-hmm. and they, there was a big backlash at, at lep about this and people have put out statements and stuff but like that kind of stuff at least in the western culture and i don't know mm-hmm. enough about china and korea and these other other regions i just think like that kind of stuff needs to step up a lot yeah i mean i, I do think that there are a lot of female players for for the games and i think you know yes culturally things can move forward and i think that's what you're talking about is more like big picture if you want a lot of females mm-hmm. i think short term what it actually just requires is is someone who is outstanding right like an incredible talent mm-hmm. that that can't be denied uh, g- the gaguri was the overwatch pro yeah, yeah exactly like some someone you know short term it's it's always going to be someone so damn good that you can't ignore them right you know it doesn't matter about any other things because at the end of the day the orgs want to make money and the orgs want to win right and you get someone in there who's just so good that they can't be ignored and and that's what i think can then show right like mm-hmm. when that works that shows that hey this this can work with other people too right from from like i come from wow i always think of, of halfway with pro gaming she won a bunch of tournaments yeah uh, i actually played you know in a tournament with her played all kinds of times on, online with her she was better than many of the other uh you know male pro she was one of the best in the world like inarguably mm-hmm. right she was incredible at the game and her playing as a pro also encouraged uh some other yeah. other females and people saw hey this actually worked and there was no one nearly as successful, but there was a couple other female pros who, who did actually come out and play at some MLGs and things like that. But I, you know, I think having those kind of examples and seeing that you know, not only can you compete, but you can actually be the best, I think is a great role model for, for other women and, and also a great example for the teams to show, hey, this is worth exploring. Yeah, I think there's a higher chance of that happening if these barriers start get broken mm-hmm. down. Definitely. Yeah. All right, we got one more question here from Matthew Schneidman, I believe. Uh, I've been a few, huge fan of the LCS since season five, and I really want to get some of my friends into it. My question is, how can the LCS continue to expand with leagues ever inclining? I think he's saying like the the learning curve is getting more and more steep. He mm. says, I know a few people want to get in the LCS, but are really intimidated by this. Thanks, Aphelios. Uh, he's specifically saying, like, watching. Yeah. Watching. So to, yeah. Like, he wants like, to get his friends into it, but it's getting more and more complicated because there's more and more champions getting at it. Like, what can he do yeah. or what can and, we do? To and I think, yeah. it, it, I think it is paired. Even if you're just talking about watching, you're more interested in watching uh, if, if you play it at least at some level, right? Yes. So for me, the first step is always playing with friends and being able to play with friends um, that are much lower than you. Like, there are some more loops that you have to go through um, to be able to get people's accounts up and uh, rank restrictions and stuff like that that you won't really want to play with people. Um, but if it's a brand new, fresh person, of course, you just you have to do start from the very big beginning and normal games and stuff like that. I think that is important to get them to be like a long-term viewer, mm-hmm. but I will watch an eSport based on the stories. So I would say try and sell them on the stories. Like, oh, Let's watch double lift. I like double lift for these reasons. Or like, let's watch this final because Faker's going for his fourth. He's the Michael Jordan of League of Legends. Like you do that type of stepping stone through to like, why do I care about this person winning? Because then at the very least, when they get a kill, even if you're not understanding what's happening, it's like, oh yeah, that's the guy I know. I'm going to cheer for him. That's, mm-hmm. I think, very important. I think you nailed it because yeah. and, and there's there's lots of great content like like I would say eyes on and things like that that I've shared a lot of that content with my family and some friends who are who are like what the hell do you do right like explain this to me <laughs> yeah. and I'm like just watch this right <laughs> yeah. and 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 it works so much better because they see it and and then they can get it right they see that yeah. these players are are training like pros they're playing in big stadiums there's millions of people around the world that care it's you know 
huge tournaments, big pressure. People get all these things. There's so many things. While there is tons about the LCS and, and you know, League of Legends, these little complexities of inside the game that you might not understand, people who are any like into sports at all or, or really, you know, just any, any walk of life, yeah. yeah, they get so mm-hmm. much about it. And we kind of forget that they're all are also all these similarities, right? And there's great documentaries on, on Netflix now about League of Legends. Mm-hmm. There's all the Eyes On episodes. There's so many, you know, more people-focused ones because I think mm-hmm. you nailed it. I think that's the I, way to get I fans disagree. You should explain topside map split <laughs> and that will really watch get the there. breakdown. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what I was going to say though is, I think don't be intimidated by the idea that the barrier for entry is increasing as game knowledge gets updated. A new viewer doesn't feel that they're totally lost to begin with. So like, <laughs> <laughs> can't be any more lost. <laughs> it's it, like I don't know what any champion is. It doesn't matter that you introduced a new one to a roster of 140. I don't think that the 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 barrier to entry for a new fan is increasing. So don't get disincentivized by that. Like the meta is always changing. There's always new champions. Even with the ones you know, they're getting changed. The, the, the rift is getting changed. The new fan isn't going to know any of that stuff anyways. And that's why the storylines thing is important because the game knowledge will come as they watch. And since the game changes anyways, it's not like, ah, I need to build it up again. It's mm-hmm. like, well, you, they never had it. So I agree with you guys. That's a huge part. I think it, it is in tandem. You need the stories um, and, and the background yep. info and stuff like that. But also, I like just pointing towards the very peak of play. If you highlight like why X person is the very best or why this play was like so amazing, whenever I watch any other game, uh, you know, new game that's coming out or something like that, or s- something that I've never really watched before, mm-hmm. um, I'm still interested in the best in the world at. Uh, Counter-Strike, which is a game that I don't pay a lot of close attention to. But whenever somebody is super popping off or the year where Cloud9 uh, made, made this huge breakthrough for mm-hmm. North America and we, we'd always been trash and they were like, they won a major. I was like, hell yeah, what's going on? Like tuning in and stuff well, like that. Is that not more the storyline thing though? You can't- So for me, I was excited by the like the actual headshots and like the, the oh, okay. like, oh my God, that's mm-hmm. so crazy, the, the peak play. Um, so, so I, I think the, the peak play al- along with the background stories on people. I think it's the background stories. Did you guys ever watch the Smash documentary? Yep. Yeah, like that revitalized the dying scene by itself because they did such a good job presenting the history and story of that game. Mm-hmm. And like that's how powerful a good, I think a good story is because they did explain some of the mechanics and like why they were good. But like you really cared because there's this guy who won like 39 straight games and then like it took three people to take him down finally before there was a new best player. Like mm-hmm. that kind of storyline is like, wow, tell me about that dude. And they do a great job with it. Sweet. Well, I think that's going to do it for this episode of The Dive. Thank you, Jat, for being the special Thanks for guest. having me. No problem, <laughs> bud. We might even have you back. I'm excited. If you're well, well not, not for a little. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> <cool>. <laughs> Mark's been a little insecure about his <laughs> yeah, spot right here. here. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have you back too, Mark. Don't worry. Okay, you. you guys can catch us on Academy Rush Friday, and then the LCS will be back Saturday. Countdown should start at 11, or no, 1.30 on Saturday. 11.30 on Sunday for the countdown, and that is going to be followed by CLG versus 100 Thieves, so we will see you there. All right, let's get to some this or that filming. Let's get some food. Bye.